So um, spies and spying have been uh, a little bit in the news over the last month. We didn't know officially, of course, that this was going to happen when we started planning this little party a year ago. Um, but since we've been talking about the spies and spying a lot, we, uh, we got a few for you, and they will be doing talks and a panel over the next few days. Um, the first one up is uh, Ray McGovern, formerly from the CIA. Now, there are two CIAs. Um, the first CIA is the one you know from the movies. That's the one that, you know, stole the Italian elections in 1948, broke the strikes in France in 1949, then removed the democratically elected leader of Iran in 1953, and that was just for starters. That's the one. The other CIA, what it was supposed to be about, intelligence, was the analyst bit, who look at the world and try to figure out what is going on and then advise U.S. presidents about what to do. That was the part that Ray was part of, not the other part that take down democratically elected governments. So I'd like to give you a very warm welcome for Ray, who is not in a suit because, of course, the TSA sent his suitcase to some continents that nobody knows right now. I've been chasing it up for the last 24 hours. Um, but luck with have it, he was wearing the correct uh, black T-shirt when he was on the plane, so he's wearing that right now. So, um, Ray, without further ado, take it away. Thanks, man. Wow. Wow, thank you all. What, a, what an honor and a privilege it is to be here. Uh, Arshin just explained uh, why my wardrobe isn't uh, the usual one. I, I usually use this as an undershirt uh, because it's a little dangerous in Washington to be uh, clothed in this. Uh, but it is actually, in all seriousness, a, uh, a, a symbol of uh, the nonpartisanship that exists in Washington now among those who care about our Constitution. Most of you have either a Constitution or a basic law or something to guide you, and most of you hold your politicians responsible, accountable for following the laws in that Constitution. Uh, ours has fallen into serious disrepair, and uh, so it is no joke to suggest that what is uh, written on my shirt is what should happen to our two most recent presidents. Why? Because they have betrayed our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution. The last line of the Declaration of Independence speaks of these very, very brave people uh, who are willing, willing to risk much for an enterprise that very likely would have them hanging at the end of a rope. There was no guarantee that the American Revolution would succeed. It was altogether likely that these men who pledged, and I'll read from the last line of the Declaration of Independence, we mutually pledge to this enterprise our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Sacred honor. As an army officer, long before I worked for the CIA, I made a solemn oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That's the way the oath reads. That's the same oath that all army officers and millions of people employed by various governments, local and federal, in our country. I've checked with the lawyers. The oath has no expiration date. And that's serious, because the question is not should we do anything about what's happening now, but what should we do? And the only thing we shouldn't do is nothing. Let me be very specific here. After the Constitution was framed, uh, George Mason, who lived uh, in northern Virginia, not far from where I live, decided that he couldn't sign it. <laughs> he, went to, he went to James Madison, with whom he drafted the Constitution. He said, I'm sorry, Jim, <laughs> I, I, I hate to tell you this, but I can't sign. And uh, James Madison w went out of his gourd, and he said, he said, George, you helped me draft this thing. What's going on here? And George said, look, it doesn't have a Bill of Rights. I can't, in good conscience, sign a Constitution that doesn't have a Bill of Rights. 
And so James Madison worked out a deal with Mason. He said, look, keep quiet about this, okay? Because if you make a big deal of this, the Constitution is not going to be signed. And I promise you that I'll send horsemen up and down the, the eastern coast and get every one of our state legislatures to ratify those first ten amendments. And he lived up his, to his promise, and that's why we have the First Amendment. I won't read them all, just one, four, and five, because those are the ones that come into play these days. Okay, First Amendment. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Whoa. Look what's happening now in our country. Look how avidly seeking they are, avidly after people like Julian Assange, not to mention Bradley Manning. Okay, uh, Amendment 4, and this is the one that's getting the most notoriety these days, most because, uh, mostly because it's being uh, honored in the breach, which means not honored, okay? Here it is. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated nor shall warrants issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. I mean, how more specific can you get against what's been going on by the National Security Agency and GCHQ and many of your own intelligence agencies and monitoring everything we say on the phone, everything we write on our, our internet, is, is that a reasonable search or seizure? Is that probable cause? Are we, all, are we all militants or suspected terrorists? Well, I guess we must be because that must be the probable cause. And particularly describing the place and to be searched and the persons or things to be seized, well, there are no particulars in the bl these blanket orders to seize everything. A as you all know better than I, the technology makes it possible just to scoop it all up, you know? Uh, don't, don't look at a target or somebody who may have consorted with Osama bin Laden. Just get it all categorized nicely, and then you can retrieve anything you want on Ray McGovern and anybody else. So that's how, how bad that is. Last one I'll just read very briefly. Amendment 5, no person. Now, it could have said no American, or it could have said no citizen, but it says no person. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, except for persons on the president's list for assassination. Oh, no. that last part... That last part isn't there. I just imagined it. No one can imagine something like that, could they? A kill list every Tuesday reviewed by the president. So we're in trouble deep, folks. And for once, uh, we don't need appeasement from our European friends. I mean, there was appeasement way back when I was born. And uh, what I'd like is to see you democratic governments and people holding us Americans, holding us re accountable and responsible for, for following our Constitution and our laws. I think it's come to that. And I think, uh, I dare say, just judging from what I see out here and uh, what I've seen happen among you people who are not only technologically proficient, but have a conscience, all right? a conscience that these laws will be once again honored. Um, let me go through the, the first slide here because uh, I want to talk about uh, a, the bigger picture here. How do we get into the, into the situation we now find ourselves in? It has to do with empire, okay? It has to do with, well, let me just start out by saying that my my Irish grandfather gave me all kinds of wisdom, all right? And he used to sit me, sit, sit me down and say, Now, Raymond, uh, tell me, he says, uh, do you know, do you know uh, why the sun never sets on the British Empire? Now, we Irish had our own experience with the British Empire, didn't we? 
He said, well, he says, why does the sun never set on the British Empire? I said, I don't know, Grandpa. He says, well, because the good Lord would never trust the British in the dark. <laughs> he also told me something much more, uh, much more enlivening for us, us bigoted Irishmen. And he said, you know, Raymond, uh, except for the ugly ones, uh, the Irish are the most beautiful race on earth. <laughs> well, we never had an Irish empire, but we had a Dutch empire, didn't we? And we had a British empire, and now we have an American empire. I want to tell you how it all started. In my view, and I'm not the, the most, the most, the greatest historian, but it seems to me, and I was born right before World War II and looked into it and lived in Germany for many years, it seems to me that we became the sole remaining superpower in the world, not after the Soviet Union imploded, but right in 1945 when that terrible war ended and we emerged relatively unscathed. And so the challenge was to our policymakers, wow, now the Russians, they lost 25, 30 million people. Wow. And look what happened to Germany and the British. Man, we are sitting in the, you know, we're sitting pretty high here. Now, how should we devise our policy? Now, I found, not in graduate school, but more recently, that George Kennan, whom I admired greatly, he was ambassador to the Soviet Union, which was my specialty in, in academe, and, uh, you know, he, he was the author of the containment policy, and I had great admiration for him until I saw that as the first chairman of the Policy Planning Council of the State Department, he wrote this as the first paper. Can we do the first one? All right, you get the picture, I hope. It's a sad picture. But uh, we came out of the war thinking that not only were we luckier and more fortunate, but that we were do more than other countries. Uh, we were, as the president keeps saying, the sole indispensable country in the world. Well, do any of us uh, still do antonyms? Uh, opposites. What's the opposite of indispensable? Right, right. Dispensable, okay? So if we're the only indispensable country in the world, you other guys, dispensable by definition. And this is where it all started. And what you get as the years go by is, next slide please, Watch carefully, because this is just one minute. Got some sound? Sound? Okay, let me tell you what Colin Powell is saying. This is February of 2001, before 9-11, and he's saying, Saddam Hussein has no weapons of mass destruction. We have been able to keep them from him. He's not a threat even to his immediate neighbors. What is Condoleezza Rice saying? Six weeks before 9-11, she is saying on this Sunday talk show, uh, Saddam Hussein is no threat even to his immediate neighbors. He doesn't control all of his country and we've been able to keep his arms from him. Six weeks, the 29th of, of July, 2001. Six weeks later, what happened? 9-11, and you've heard it a hundred times, haven't you? After 9-11, everything changed, you got it. After 9-11, everything 
change. So we were being asked to believe that whereas in late July of 2001, Saddam Hussein had no weapons of mass destruction, all of a sudden, after 9-11, weapons of mass destruction descended from the heavens like manna for a soft landing on the sands of Iraq where God made that terrible mistake of putting our oil. <laughs> you know, you know how I learned this first? I learned this from John Pilger. Some of you know John Pilger, an incredible maker of documentaries and, and writer. He came to interview me, and he did a documentary right after the war started. And he sent me an advanced copy. And I saw these things. And when I saw them, they had sound, okay? And I said, oh, my goodness, how come I didn't know about that? Well, I tried to keep up with these things, but it didn't appear anywhere in the American media. And even if I had LexisNexis, well, if I had LexisNexis, I probably could have found it, which makes me think, was there no U.S. journalist in Cairo? or watching that Sunday talk show? Or, or if there were a U.S. journalist who wrote that up, did it not get into some paper because somebody said, well, that wouldn't be, <laughs> that would be pornographic, but <laughs> that wouldn't be suitable, okay? I was warned about not to use any pornography here. It's, uh, so, so uh, you know, so that, that points up uh, what I'm gonna bring out a little bit later too. And that is, I've been in Washington now a little bit more than 50 years came down first as an army officer, then worked for the CIA. And you see a lot of change in 50 years, right? <laughs> now, people say, uh, what kind of changes have you seen? I said, well, I've seen a lot, but there's one that dwarfs all the other changes in significance. And that change is simply that we no longer have in the United States a free media, and that is big. And if it weren't for you guys and people like you, if it weren't for the internet and the web, nobody would know nothing about anything in our country. Right now, we know one heck of a lot. Thanks, not only to you all and Julian Assange, but Bradley Manning and Edward Snowden, for whom I have great respect and uh, who I hope will escape the clutches. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I take out of my, well, it's, it's not only my faith tradition, but it's my experience in the inner city of Washington, where I've been working ever since I retired from the CIA, and that is, um, that is that unless you have personal experience with innocent suffering, you don't get it or it's really hard for you to get it. Now, I'm Jesuit educated, for which I'm really thankful for the most part, and I'd like to show you what uh, the head of the Jesuits, who happened to be a Dutchman, had to say about this point. Could we show this one? Could we show this one? So he's talking about heart here. And we know that Bradley Manning was moved by... What's that? Okay. We know that uh, Bradley Manning was moved by, uh, by what he saw in Iraq. And what he saw in Iraq, of course, was not only brutalization, but war crimes. I do not exaggerate, folks. It's a war crime by definition to shoot up innocent civilians trying to rescue the wounded. That's a war crime. What Bradley Manning wanted us to know was what was being done in our name. Edward Snowden, the same way. But the point here is that unless you have some empathy, which seems to be very much missing in our world today, uh, you're not able to catalyze your thinking 
so that you can move to the next step. Solidarity, inquiry, moral reflection, and then what? Action, right? And that's what we're about here today. We're going to try to think about how we can turn our vast resources, our technical abilities, and our consciences into making a moral difference. I just want to uh, append something here before I uh, go to the next slide, and that is, you know, when people talk about Iraq, long before the United States invaded Iraq, when the sanctions were exacting their horrible toll, and when Madeleine Albright, the previous Secretary of State, was asked, uh, you know, 500,000 children, that is, one half million children under five have, have perished because of these sanctions. Do you think that's worth it? And what'd she say? Yeah, it's worth it. Well, that's the opposite. That's the opposite of what we're talking about here, empathy. How people can be that callous is something that really, uh, really kind of always baffles me. When I was studying college, I learned a couple of things about uh, moral theology and ethics. One of them was um, that, you know, torture is always wrong. That slavery is always wrong. You know, there were certain things we called uh, intrinsic evil. You know, they inhabited the same moral category as rape. Always, always wrong. Now, the people who try to simplify things for sophomores in college, uh, our professor of moral theology, I remember him saying, first day, look, uh, class, it's very simple. Uh, moral theology, ethics, uh, is simply you do good and you avoid evil. Okay? And that sounded right to me. And I went for decades thinking that was right. And now I realize I'm only half right. Okay, you do good, of course you do good. Do you avoid evil, folks? No, you challenge evil, you confront evil. Only that way can you be a moral person. You don't sit around, you know. You don't sit around and let evil happen and say, it's not my business. And that's why I think most of you are here, to see what we can do about the evil that goes on in the world, given the incredible capabilities that are at work right here in this room. I see a lot of young people here. And uh, that's just terrific because, uh, you know, I was about to say something that my, my son, when he was 20 years old, really reamed me out about and about 2,000 other people. He was introduced at this Catholic Reform Conference at the end as uh, a, a member of the, the com coming generation who are going to be, you know, going to be living into what we're espousing. And, and he got up and he said, I'm not a coming generation. I'm here now. There are a lot of us that are 20 years old. There are a lot of us that are 30 years old. We're here now, and we're not the comers. We're here. And what I see a lot of here are people who are 20, 30, who are the people who are going to be determining our moral outlook on things. I was reviewing some of the heroes that I, that I have uh, and that I've experienced over the years, the last couple of years, or the last 10 years, really, and I found out that most of them are 20 or 20 or so, 20 ish, okay? And 28 seems to be the real key. Uh, Annie Machon was 28 when she blew the whistle on MI5 in the UK. Uh, Asma Mahfouz, the young girl who started the, the revolution in, in Cairo using your technology, she was 28. Who else is 28 here? Well, I have to confess that I was 28 once. Yep, it was a couple of years ago. <laughs> and I blew it. I didn't have the courage. I didn't have the insight. I, I didn't have the background that I have now, thanks to the folks that it's been my lot to be thrown in with. Let me explain. 
Uh, I was an analyst, a Soviet analyst, working on Vietnam. And one of my colleagues, by the name of Sam Adams, uh, was a, a terrific, terrific analyst, and he was given the account of counting up how many Vietnamese communists were under arms in South Vietnam. And Sam was really, he was out of Harvard, and he was just a terrific guy. He had served in the Navy in Vietnam. He got all this material together. We were an all-source operation, so you had intercepted messages, clandestine reports, photography, POW reports, FBI. We had it all together. Okay, so he got this big desk, and he figured out there were between 500 and 600,000 Vietnamese communists under arms in South Vietnam. And everybody said, Sam? General Westmoreland, he says, there can't be more than 299,000. So Sam thought, you know, that's kind of an odd number, that there can't be more than 299,000. So he went over to Saigon to see, you know, to kind of go through the, the OB, the order of battle, to try to figure out, you know, why the numbers were so different. And when he said, well, this regiment, of course, has 200, and they said, no, no, General Westmoreland says this only has 100. Well, this platoon has 30, no, no, only 15. And in the bar that night, one of these uh, sergeants in the intelligence apparatus who had a little bit too much to drink came up. He said, Mr. Adams, Mr. Adams uh, <laughs> you're not going to persuade these guys because General Westmoreland has put a lid. It can't be more than 299,000, and you just better go home to Washington because you're not going to persuade him at all. Well... Sam and I used to have lunch because we came into the agency together when John Kennedy was president. And I said, Sam, what possible incentive could General Westmoreland, the head of our forces in Vietnam, have to diminish the number of, of enemy? And he said, Ray, you won't believe this, but, you know, uh, they've been killing so many each week, and they have the kill counts and all that kind of stuff. And the, the press in Saigon is not real bright, but they can do arithmetic and subtraction, okay? And so if you add up all the stuff that we killed, you can't possibly, they can't possibly admit that there is still more. So I said, Sam, that's awful. He said, oh, that's not it. That, that's a half of it. Ray, this morning, the day was August 20th, 1967. This morning, we got a cable from, from General Abrams. Abrams was Westmoreland's deputy. I said, what did it say? I'll quote you what it said. We can't possibly accept Adams' highest, higher numbers because we've been projecting an image of success in this war, and there is nothing we could do despite all the explanations and caveats to prevent the media from drawing a gloomy and erroneous conclusion. There it was, folks, in black and white in a very sensitive cable. Wow. I said, Sam, is that, where is that? He says, well, it's in the director's office. You have to go up there to, to read it. I said, so he put that in black and white? He said, yeah. So what, what did McGovern think? Well, wow. You know, we're, we've, we've got already about 25,000 people killed on our side in this war. Probably by that time, there were a million Vietnamese killed. You know, what I should do is take that cable down to the New York Times Bureau in Washington and show them. Just take a copy of it and say, this is what's going on here. Now, you have to realize, those of you who are not as old as I, that there was a time when the, the New York Times was an independent newspaper. <laughs> no, no. No, it really was. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they actually would, would print this stuff. You know, they'd verify it and then print it. Look what they did with Ellsberg. They faced into it and they did it, okay? As a matter of fact, and this is an interesting story that very few people know, Dan Ellsberg's first leak was to the New York Times, and what did he leak? Sam Adams' figures on the enemy battle, uh, on the enemy numbers, okay? Wow. At about the same time, Neil Sheehan was given more information even Dan doesn't know who did this, that Westmoreland was requesting 206,000 more U.S. troops to bring the war into Cambodia, up into North Vietnam, and maybe a little bit into China, you know, all right? Now, LBJ, Lyndon Johnson, 
Three weeks after these leaks, I'm talking mid-March, uh, 1968, after tech, tech did the Tet Offensive, where it was pr proven that there were <laughs> a half million Vietnamese under arms since they, they attacked every hamlet, village, and city in South Vietnam. LBJ said in a small meeting of, of uh, counselors, he said, you know, we don't have any support for this war because of those damn New York Times leaks. I think we've got to go to negotiations. We've got to stop the bombing. And by the way, I've decided I'm not going to run for office in November. That was March 31st, 1968. So these things can have a huge impact. But what happened? Of course, Humphrey didn't win. The war went on. And Sam Adams, my friend, died an early death at the age 56, I believe it was, with incredible remorse that he went through the system, you know? He tried to do what Tom Drake tried to do in NSA, the, the inspector general and all the things. The, the ethos was so strong that you weren't supposed to talk to the press, and, and they diddled Sam. And Sam felt very responsible for the fact that those of you who know the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, that it's a, a great big V, right? Okay? Actually, it's a V like this. Well, that whole wing of that, that monument wouldn't be there today if the war had stopped then because there'd be no names to chisel into that granite. And Sam went to his death regretting that he didn't step out of the system early enough to stop that damn war. And I roam around quite live and quite sorrowful that I didn't have the guts to do what Bradley Manning did at age 22, uh, what Snowden did at age 29. I was 28 years old. I didn't have the guts to do what they do. And so I have an extra appreciation of what it took and how we need to support them. Okay. Now, for those of you who, uh, who weren't around for Vietnam, and that's most of you, uh, I, I chose a, a five-minute little uh, clip that I think says an awful lot about an awful lot of things, including General Westmoreland. So, are we going to have any sound with this? We won't, huh? Okay. Well, this is a clip that simply talks about how uh, very technical uh, fighter bombers from Vietnam, from, from the U.S., uh, did their job without any real compassion, without any real realization of what was going on on the ground, okay? And uh, at the end, Westmoreland uh, is interviewed well after the war. He's in this fancy suit, and he says, well, you know, the Oriental doesn't have the same, the same importance that he attaches to life. Life is cheap in the Orient. And so uh, we took that into account because they look at life a lot different from the way we do. You have to see it to believe it. Check out Breast Check, or I can give you the URL later. Now, there it is, folks. Uh, that's a racist policy from beginning to end. People who don't look like us or people who ha wear funny things on the top of their head. Uh, are, have we succumbed to the notion that, that we can pursue racist policies in places like the Middle East like we did in Vietnam? It's really, you know, it's really very, very bad, and the supreme irony, of course, is that uh, President Obama has shown himself to be acting very much like a white racist supremacist. I spare not those words, because that's the way he's been behaving. <laughs> so, next one. Next one. Um, I made the point before that uh, 
Oh, here's the, here's the flyer, okay? He's talking about how expert he was and how pinpoint his accuracy was. And, uh, you know, it really just really gets very sickening toward the end because he had absolutely no remorse, absolutely no empathy for what he was causing. And here's a naval aviator saying the same thing, a lieutenant saying, well, we did, I did 55 bombing missions. And at the end, maybe it is worth uh, uh, seeing what, uh, what must, was, how Westmoreland sort of dusts the whole thing off. When Dan Ellsberg decided to reveal the Viet Vietnam Papers, before he did, he went to Vietnam, and he had been there as a Marine. And what he did was roam around with the Marines and see what was going on in the country. Then he came back, and his wife, Patricia, who was an incredible person, took him to one of these little meetings of a Catholic worker community where they were seeing off a, a couple of them to go to prison for 10 years for resisting the draft and doing other things. And he got to thinking, wow, where am I, Dan Ellsberg, in this? Where is my empathy? Where is my challenge? And what he did, of course, was act on that, and that's what we're all called to do. Uh, well, okay, well, let's do the end of this. The, these are, the, this is proof that uh, the Oriental really doesn't care about life as much as we do. That, obviously, is a widow who is, uh, who is mourning the, the death of her. Uh, oh, there's Westmoreland. Yeah, let's see if I can remember. It's, yeah, or the Oriental. Yeah, yeah. Not the same person in life that we have. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, right, right. You, you got to understand, yeah, they don't really, no. Nah. They're Orientals. They don't look like us. And so that's what we have to, you know, kind of do what we have to do. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. See ya. Sorry that the sound didn't come on, but that's pretty much a, a paraphrase of what he said. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the media, because the media is, in many ways, the fly in the ointment. And uh, I have a, a little clip of a time when CNN let me on uh, their show, I, I average, until recently, I've averaged uh, getting on CNN domestic once every three and a half years. Um, now, I, uh, you'll see in a minute why I don't expect to get on CNN domestic anytime soon. The CNN Na International may be once a year. But uh, they were out for Julian Assange. It was one of these rampages where they had to, dis they had to describe him as a not journalist, right? That's the whole thing. If you say he's not a journalist, then you can do all manner of things to him, right? And so they, I guess they, they went at it so hard and heavy that somebody said, you ought to have some, you know, some balance here, so why don't you ask McGovern to come on, and you, you can ask him questions, and, you know. So that's what happened. I agreed to come on. Can we show the next one? Yeah. Oh, not getting, not getting any sound. Okay, we'll have more time for questions. What else do, do we have on the agenda here? Uh, well, let me, uh, let me say this, that uh, we all have our principles and we all have our capabilities to do good or evil. But uh, what I've learned in the last few years is that, uh, you know, it's nice to have principles but if you're not willing to act on those principles, specifically if you're not willing to risk, if you're not willing to suffer for those principles, then they don't really amount to more than a hill of beans. And that's what we're talking here about when we, when we talk about Julian Assange, when we talk about Bradley Manning or Edward Snowden. What risks, what risks they have taken um, I think that uh, I'll recount for you a real, uh, a real perception I got from a course I took in uh, racial profiling and white privilege. Uh, 
At the end of this three-day session, uh, the big African-American uh, leader came up and he said, you know, you, <laughs> you, you white people, you, <laughs> you really, you're really something. He says, you know, you say, oh, what can we do? Oh, what can we do? He says, well, I'll tell you what you can do. You can take that backpack of white privilege off your back, open it up, and see what's in there, your education, your money, all the other advantages you have. And if you're not willing to put them into play, then get out of here. You, you, you don't understand anything about racial reconciliation. He says, because, you know, if, uh, if you have your heel on my neck and, 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 and you're saying, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I have my heel on your neck. Uh, it's not about whether you're aware that you have... It's getting your foot off my neck, thank you very much. Now that's the way most of the world looks at us. And what we have to do is to get, to get that foot off other people's necks. Now, there's not a lot of... Uh, time left for us to change things around, folks. I want to close uh, with uh, one of the things I learned while I was in Germany. Uh, again, just talking about people in their 20s. Sophie Scholl is one of my heroes. If you don't know about her, you ought to read up on her. But uh, there was a really restrictive atmosphere there, as you know, and and very few people stood up and took chances. And one of them was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, many of you know he was a Lutheran pastor. He tried to face up to things, and, and he was hanged, okay? There was another gentleman named Albrecht Haushofer. Has anybody heard about Albrecht Haushofer? Good, good, good. All right, I'm going to tell you about Albrecht, okay? He was a geolog. Uh, he was a geologist at the University of Berlin. And you know how you get to be at the University of Berlin, full professor? He had tenure. He kept his mouth shut. He kept his mouth shut as he watched his neighbors being rounded up, his Jewish friends and others. So he had tenure, and then he, and then he sort of had a conscience, too. Like Ed Snowden, like Bradley Manning, like so many people out here from whom you're going to hear later. And so he said, you know, I think maybe I ought to do something about this. So he gathered a, a group around him and became a very popular figure, endangered the regime, wrapped up, put in a different Berlin prison from the one that Haushofer was in. And uh, the uh, Gestapo was very orderly. Uh, some of you may know that. Uh, they were always requiring that people, before they executed them, and they would hang them or shoot them, uh, that they had to sign a confession. Now, Haushofer was just, you know, he said, I'm not going to sign any confession. And as the Allies approached, as with, with uh, Bonhoeffer, uh, they executed him. They shot Haushofer. And as they picked him up from the, from the ground, out of, his, out of his pocket fell a little settle, a little, little piece of paper. And you know what it was? It was a sonnet, and the title was Schuld, Schuld, Guilt. And this is the way it read. Doch bin ich schuldig, aber anders als ihr denkt. Yeah, I'm guilty, but it's not what you're thinking. Ich musste früher meine Pflicht erkennen. I should have früher, earlier seen my duty. Ich muss das schärfer Unheil, Unheil nennen. I should have more sharply called evil, evil. Mein Urteil habe ich zu lang gelenkt. I put off my judgment far too long. Ich habe gewarnt. I did warn. And he did. He had all these folks around him. Ich habe gewarnt, aber nicht genug und klar. Klar? Claro. There's no comparative in, just in, in German for klar, klar. So, ich habe gewohnt, aber nicht genug, not enough, und klar. Und heute weiß ich, 
was ich schuldig war. And today, I recognize what I was guilty of. Martin Luther King has said, there is such a thing as too late. And that's true. And I'm going to do everything I can in my remaining years to make sure that we turn this thing around. And there's no hope at all of any success in this without you all. You are, you all are the, the great leavener, leveler, okay? Uh, it doesn't matter how many battleships or aircraft carriers or stealth bombers people have, you guys with your cyber capabilities have as much power now as any superpower in the world, and that can be demonstrated and has been demonstrated. So, in a very, very real sense, you know, I find myself honored to be with you for these few days, to learn from you, and to get some insights and, and more, more hope to buttress my thinking that we're going to come out of this all right, but it's going to take all of us. Thank you very much. Do we have five minutes? Could you put the last slide up? Thanks a lot. I have a, I have a last slide here which gives some, uh, some URLs, uh, but I, I do want to, we have five minutes left, and I do want to entertain a, a question or two. If anybody has a short question, maybe two or three we could, we could do with. Yes, question here. Let me, let me repeat the question, or unless, why don't you get up there and then it would be recorded. Thank you. Just while he's getting there, uh, the, top, the top URL there, the link, is to a 12-minute version of a German panorama report, which is incredibly good on Bradley Manning. And the others are links that you can get uh, uh, some, some I hopeful, hopefully interesting stuff. Please. Hello, my name is Arjan. Uh, so Obama's campaign started with change. I think we can conclude there was not any change. Um, he took a power, he didn't change the whole program that Bush started. There's also no hope, at least the hope is not coming from him. What do you think about future American leaders? What do you think about, for example, a rent poll that mm -hmm. is one of the only ones who is really competing mm -hmm. against this uh, legislation? Sure. Well, we, uh, we intelligence officers, even former ones, uh, don't comment on you know, specific personalities. But you know, the point I like to make here is that we are the ones who have been waiting for, OK? Ain't nobody going to do it for us. It's got to be us. And uh, Ron Paul has some really good uh, ideas on foreign policies, got really terrible ideas on other stuff. And so we got to pick and choose and make sure that we do the pressure that we need to do. Next one. Just a quick question on um, your suggestion that we hold the U.S. accountable for their actions. Do you have any specific recommendations, for example, boycott? Where should we start? Who should we boycott? What should we do? Well, there's a system of law here. EC has its own system of law. Hold them to it, for Pete's sake, you know? Don't just acquiesce in everything they're that the, the They're the same organization. Well, then that's up to us, really. It's up to us as a groundswell. Obama said when he was elected that he would shut down Guantanamo. How do you see that it would be even possible to shutting down Guantanamo? No, it's entirely possible. There are 86 people there that uh, should be freed uh, today, this afternoon. Obama needs a backbone implant, okay? My name is Jaap, and I have a question which is not concerning the United States, but the whole world. Do we have all the ingredients of fascism appearing, high un unemployment, uh, extreme unrest, uh, ideas about strong people who should rule, like in Greece, there, there's already this thing approaching which is terrifying. Do you see fascism appearing again? Do I think what? 
do you see fascism, fascism appear again? It's uh, raising its ugly head. Uh, and uh, when you see some of the extreme measures that are laws now, just as everything Hitler did in Germany was legal, that's why I went to the Constitution. There can't be legal laws if they're in direct violation of those articles of the Constitution. Thank you very much, everyone.